Welcome everyone to day three of this ASNIC two-week virtual nuclear cardiology elective. Today we have here with us uh, my colleague, Dr. Hisham Skali from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School teaching this course. Dr. Skali is Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School. He's also the Associate Director of the Cardiac Rehabilitation Program and he's the director of the CV Imaging Outreach Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Joining him today will be one of our fellows, Dr. Aldo Skignoni, who will be helping with the cases. So without further ado, um, Hisham, please take on. Thank you, Dr. Dorbala. This is an exciting opportunity for ASNEC and for our faculty, actually, to be able to reach this many people with this virtual uh, teaching sessions. I'm very excited about this and I hope to get a lot of interactions from everybody present. We're about ten, at about 260 people participating um, today and I'm sure we're going to get a lot more people. So um, let me share my screen here. Can any, everybody see this uh, introduction? slide here in, in the chat box, you can just say yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so uh, as Dr. Dubala mentioned, I've been helped with two of our STAR fellows, Dr. Singh and Dr. Skinoni here to collect these cases. What I'd like to talk about today is really about the basics of stress testing, how we read uh, the EKGs, and what kind of emergencies we might encounter in the stress lab. So, um, you know, uh, they, when we have patients exercise, uh, in the stress lab and we're talking about whether they go on a treadmill or, or on, a, on a bike, stationary bike, as is done in several parts of the world, you will expect several physiologic uh, responses that you can see here on this slide that are uh, summarized. You will see a decrease in the vagal tone and increase in the sympathetic tone as well, which will lead to an increase in the heart rate and stroke volume. And this will eventually uh, lead to an increase in the cardiac output, which is what we need when we exercise to match the myocardial uh, oxygen demand that are increasing. Um, peripherally you, and centrally also, you will see increase in blood flow both in the coronaries and in the peripheral arteries to uh, help with the increased extraction of oxygen. And so with stress testing, you will see some responses. Some might be normal and some might be abnormal. On the left-hand side of the screen, I've listed the normal uh, and expected uh, responses that you might see. So the heart rate and the blood pressure will increase and uh, eventually your cardiac output will increase with that. Your peripheral resistance will decrease. And you might see some mild benign dysrhythmias related to the change in your sympathetic and vagal tone, such as isolated and unifocal PVCs and PACs that might decrease and be completely suppressed higher heart rates. And physiologically also, as you might expect, your oxygen consumption will increase. Abnormal responses are essentially things that we do not expect to go in that direction. So such as, for example, your heart rate failing to go above 120 beats per minute or an inability to obtain 85% of your age predicted max heart rate. With um, exercise, your blood pressure, as I mentioned, should increase. So if you see a drop in your blood pressure, in your systolic blood pressure, that's something that's, that we would qualify as an abnormal response and it might have a few uh, etiology that we might go over. And also, if you have marked hypertension, such as blood pressure going over 220, over 110, uh, that's also an abnormal response. And uh, if you develop any chest pain or unusual shortness of breath. So I'd like to start with this um, polling uh, uh, the audience here, which of these is an abnormal response during exercise? And you can just do your, uh, put your responses in the chat box here. Uh, increase in heart rate as in A, B, decrease in systolic blood pressure, increase in cardiac output as in C, and D, decrease in QRS complex duration. Okay, I think it's unanimous, uh, Dr. Scali. Uh, everybody's going for B, uh, a decreased systolic blood pressure. 
Yes, so uh, I won't repeat what I saw in, in what I said in the prior slide. So all of the other options are essentially normal responses and expected uh, responses, but um, decreasing systolic blood pressure is an abnormal re response that's often due to a decrease in cardiac output, either from the severe coronary artery disease and or aortic stenosis as well. All right, so I've talked about the physiologic uh, responses to exercise, but let's focus on EKG responses to stress testing. And this is a list of all the things that we might see. And there is, these essentially involve either, either things that, are, that involve the duration of certain segments and, and, and complexes in your EKG or the amplitude of the EKG signal. So your QRS complex will decrease in size with increasing exercise with evolving exercise, but the duration of the PR interval, the QRS complex and the QT segment will actually shorten as your heart rate increases and your RR interval shortens, all these intervals also will tend to shorten usually. With that, you will see a depression in your J point, which is the seg which is the point between the end of the QRS and the beginning of the ST segment. And with that J point depression, usually you would see an upsloping of the ST segment. Usually, after 80 mil segments, which is on a standard EKG uh, tracing, after about two little squares, your ST segment should be back to its baseline and in isoelectric line. Often you might see a PR segment down sloping in the inferior leads usually, and also the R wave amplitude might decrease, might decrease at rates greater than 130 beats per minute. And so these are a couple of examples from textbooks about the patterns that we see for ST segment shifting. On the uh, left side, I'll be talking about X, uh, ST elevation. And what you can see here, uh, you can have at baseline you have, which is in red, standing pre-exercise, some patients might have rest in ST elevation, which is often sometimes a, a, a um, repolarization pattern. But the, what, that's why we use the PQ segment as our isoelectric line and as our reference point. And what you see here is that the exercise response here, which is in the blue, in the blue tracing, is actually depressed, not compared to the red line, but actually to the PQ point here. And that's what we measure as ST depression. And sometimes you can have ST depressions at rest. And so you can see there here again in the red line on the right hand side of the screen. And again, you can see an exaggeration of that ST depression, but again, we would compare that to the PQ point here. Again, this dashed vertical line that you see here marks the J point, which is the the, which marks the end of the QRS and the beginning of the ST segment. And that's when we start looking at the ST segment uh, uh, electric line. These are, these are the standards that we use to diagnose ST segment changes. And I have summarized them here for the three most important, most frequent ones, ST depressions, and we would recommend, we would require at least a one millimeter or greater uh, horizontal or downsloping ST depressions. These have to be seen in about three consecutive beats. And these are, as I mentioned, related to the PQ segment, not to the TP segment, which comes after the, the, the T wave. We usually measure these at 80 milliseconds after the J point. Occasionally, when the heart rate is extremely fast, we might measure them at 60 milliseconds, but the tradition has been to measure them at 80 milliseconds. And again, we compare this to the isoelectric line, and often this is the PQ segment. You might see this frequently, which is a rapidly upsloping um, ST segment, and you can see it here in the middle of the screen. These are rarely true positive and often have a reduced specificity for uh, ischemia. ST elevations are, are findings that we usually don't like to see. And the main point that I'd like to make, if you look at this EKG, is obviously the ST segment elevation, but also to realize and remember that this QRS complex is a non-Q wave 
um, complex, right? So there are no Q waves here. And with that, you're seeing ST segments. So if you have no Q waves, no Q waves, you, these ST segments are relevant for either significant coronary artery disease. And so usually a marker of transmural ischemia and or ve, uh, ve, coronary artery spasms. If you have underlying Q waves, they may represent, this ST segment elevation may represent either an LV aneurysm or underlying wall motion abnormalities. They're not necessarily an ischemic response. So this slide summarizes pretty much all the EKG findings that you can see um, uh, during an exercise test. So the first one on the left side and the top corner is a normal uh, response. You have your QRS at rest here and an ST segment and a T wave. And with exercise, you see some not, no significant changes here. You could have also the rapid upsloping as a second pattern here, which, is also we all, which also has reduced specificity. You have minor ST depressions, which are not consistent over three beats and not profound all the time. And then you have slow upsloping ST segments here. All of these essentially have reduced specificity with the top two having a much, uh, much more likely to be normal. And then you have things that we are more confident about, such as horizontal ST segment depressions that are seen in three consecutive beats here, or downsloping ST segment depression, again, seen in three consecutive beats and compared to the PQ segments. These are the ST segment elevations that I mentioned and in a non-Q wave lead, and those are rather concerning. These are in a, seen in a complex, um, uh, in a QRS complex, which has Q waves. And again, these are often, as I mentioned, um, related to either an LV aneurysm or uh, underlying wall motion abnormalities. Q waves in anterior lateral leads often mean that there, is, there has been a large uh, anterior MI. So I see a few questions here in the chat box about ventricular tachycardia and ST elevation and subtle ST elevation in B1 with no other changes. So the ventricular tachycardia, we'll get to that in a few slides. Um, those are excellent questions. And ST elevation in AVR has been reported uh, as a corollary for uh, diffuse coronary artery disease, often involving the proximal LAD or left main artery. Those studies are uh, actually uh, relatively valid. They're old, but they, 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 we, we still use that. Often we would use a constellation of finding and not base the result of the, uh, the stress test just based on the changes that we see in AVR uh, alone. So in terms of exercise testing in the stress lab, I'd like you to remember, first of all, that for non-cardiologists out there, and for practitioners who don't do this very frequently, that this is a very safe procedure. In a summary from about eight studies, uh, the rates of any kind of, kind of complications are rather low. And especially if we talk about sudden cardiac death, we're talking at about five in less than 100,000 uh, tests. Complication rates for a variety of, um, uh, a variety of reasons are less than 0.2%, acute MIs less than 0.04%, and sudden cardiac deaths, as I mentioned, less than 0.01%. Overall event rate of serious events, death or hospitalization is less than one in 10,000. And there are, these are the AHA guidelines from 2009 about the preparation for, for uh, uh, exercise stress tendons, testing and recommendation for clinical exercise laboratories. The main thing is really to have a, a, a good preparation, trained staff, and really have uh, appropriate risk stratification of people, of patients, so you can actually um, manage them uh, and, 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 and monitor them appropriately according to their baseline risk. You obviously would need an emer written emergency plan. You'd have to, you'd take every, every stress lab is required to have a defibrillator on staff and a code cart as well. And you make sure that your staff is actually trained and ACLS certified. At the Brigham, we have some guiding principles that we we'll review periodically with our fellows and, and, and physiologists and technologists. We often err on the side of caution, meaning that we would always consider stopping the test if you have any kind of concerns. We don't hesitate at calling a code if we, if we think that things are gonna get 
uh, worse. It's and when the code team arrives, we let them manage uh, the, uh, the the code, even though we have cardiologists and cardiology fellows nearby. The code team is more appropriate to manage that. And all don't be dismissive or or consider that oh this is nothing. Um, often um, we would. Always keep in mind your differential that left main disease, severe aortic stenosis, and ventricular tachycardia can always be there. It needs the patients that are referred for a stress test already have something that required them to be referred. And then, an important asp quality aspect of the of of your stress lab is really to maintain good and appropriate communication with your referring clinicians, whether their patients are coming from the emergency room, from cardiology practices or primary care practices. You wanna make sure that you communicate with them everything that happens with the patients. So if you end up having a patient that, you, if you have a patient that has a complication in the stress lab and you send them emergently to the cat lab, you don't want your referring cardiologist or primary care to know about that, a physician to know about that when the patient sees them uh, at their post-discharge visit three weeks later. Oh, you sent me for that stress test and I ended up in the, in the cat lab with, with a stent. You want to make sure that on the same day at the time this happen, happens, that you call your referring uh, physicians and, and, and inform them of what happened to their uh, patients. So this is, these are the kind of things that can happen in, in the stress lab. Patients can develop unexpected chest pain, significant ST changes, tachy or bradyarrhythmias, hypotension, syncope and falls. Uh, and and we, we would review what, how we use vasodilator agents as well as dyspnea and wheezing with these and or seizures. So uh, just to keep this uh, interactive, I'll start with a case here, a 55 year old female with known coronary disease referred for evaluation of chest pain. She reported typical chest pain at the time of exercise with non-diagnostic ECG changes. So what do you do at, at this point? She's about four minutes into the test and she reports this chest pain that's getting worse as she's exercising. What do you do? One, continue the test and re keep getting ECG tracing. She's not at peak heart rate, so let's add regular on and figure out whether how we're gonna image her. We'll stop the test or inject regadenosan and inject systemibic. Okay, Dr. Scali, I think uh, we have a little bit of a variety of answers here. I think um, most people yeah. are saying uh, to, uh, I guess, continue your test, but it's follow uh, very close by stop the test. Yeah. And a uh, few people uh, answer inject uh, regadenosan and maybe, and maybe. Excellent, all right, so uh, good. So. The, the, it, it is probably, we have the variety of answer. Maybe it's because the, the, the stem of the question doesn't include enough details, but I think w w if I were to, remake, to redo this question, I'll make it more apparent that the, the chest pain is actually typical. It is getting worse with exercise. She's already at about uh, stage two of a bruise protocol, and she's having chest pain that's similar to what she, that she came in uh, uh, for. Usually when we have any kind of concerns with, for chest pain and we think this is not like musculoskeletal or anything like that, we would actually stop the test at that, at that stage. Um, there is no reason if you think that someone is actually ischemic to maintain the ischemia and, and, and keep it going. This was a regular ETT, so the, we would not have had a uh, system maybe um, uh, uh, available. We would stop the test. As, as I show here. And so if, if you have any significant concern for chest pain in the lab, you should stop the test. Even if there are no EKG changes, typical angina should be viewed with appropriate concern in patients with uh, medium to high pre-test likelihood. Um, you wanna alert the referring physician and consider adding imaging or performing a CT angiogram if the patient is actually stable. If you don't think, if they don't develop any arrhythmias or incessant chest pain or anything like that, you could consider sending them to the emergency room. If, if this was a, an imaging study uh, from the beginning and you had them maybe in the room at that time, you can inject them while they're having um, while they're having the, 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 uh, the pain. Um, continue monitoring the ST segments throughout the test for any changes. It's not because you take them off the treadmill that you stop monitoring their EKG. You wanna continue monitoring them uh, there. 
And then if um, they are hemodynamically stable and they have enough blood pressure room, you can give them sublingual nitroglycerin um, to see if you can uh, resolve their pain. Um, make sure that they're actually laying on a stretcher and, 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 and not actually standing where they can drop their pressure and, or fall. Don't give them nitroglycerin while they're still on the treadmill. If the chest pain remains or, or persists or even gets worse with repeated dose of sublingual nitroglycerin, um, you may need to transfer them to the cat lab or to the emergency room uh, right away. This is a, another case of a 64-year-old gentleman with atypical chest discomfort. Their primary care physician sent them for, for this. Um, as you can see here, this is their resting um, EKG, which is fairly and remarkable with uh, showing sinus rhythm with some mild sinus arrhythmia as the RR intervals are mildly variable, but otherwise no obvious um, um, ST changes or any ischemic findings or conduction of normality. The patient exercised to about 10 minutes and 13 seconds on a standard Bruce protocol. So this is already stage four. And, and um, you can see here at peak exercise, um, I hope you can see my, my pointer here moving but you can see that they, there are ST depressions that are persistent over three leads here, here, and here. Though you can see that they are not persistent over three consecutive beats. They are, they are quite deep here, but not completely persistent on over three consecutive beats, but enough actually to, to cause uh, pause. The patient was fatigued and was, and was um, uh, and stopped the test. And uh, this is a zoom on the, on the um, uh, V4 lead. There was appropriate blood pressure response with this. The patient did not drop this blood pressure, did not develop chest pain. There were no arrhythmias seen, no PVCs or not sustained VT at this, um, at this stage. So the patient needed to stop anyways when this EKG findings were happening. At a, this is at one minute of recovery that you can see here that the ST segments have completely resolved all the way through um, that what we've seen at less than a minute of recovery. So the report that we, the way we reported this test was that positive test for ischemia given the EKG changes, but reduced specificity due to absence of anginal symptoms at high workload and very rapid recovery of ECG uh, abnormalities. So I see some uh, chat comments here based on, um, and the people were appropriately asking about were there any symptoms, what was, what was the blood pressure response, um, exercise capacity trumps ST changes. Yes, you had to. So the way we would see this as is in the context of looking at all the entire data, not only the ST changes by themselves, but how long the patient exercised, what was the blood pressure, did they develop chest pain, were there any other arrhythmias, did they, how long would it take for the um, ST segments to resolve or persist, and taking the, the uh, constellation of findings here, um, we read this as a uh, probably as a normal scan with a reduced specificity for uh, ischemic um, changes. So, my next question um, which of these statements is true? Uh, presence of right bundle branch block precludes the ECG interpretation during an exercise stress test. Presence of a left bundle branch block precludes the ECG interpretation during an exercise stress test. Presence of a bundle branch block right or left precludes the ECG interpretation during an exercise stress test. Presence of a bundle branch block right or left does not preclude the ECG interpretation during an exercise stress test. And I see the overwhelming majority of responses is B for left bundle uh, branch block. And indeed, you are right. And so, uh, Left bundle branch block is actually a, um, a, a finding that does not allow us to interpret correctly EKG findings during an exercise stress test. 
this is a case of a 55 year old male referred for an exercise maybe to evaluate for ischemia this was in the context of a recent unheralded uh, syncope this is a um, the baseline ekg findings in this page uh, tracing in this patient's at rest um, as you can see there are this non-specific uh, T wave uh, inversion in lead three and V4 and flattening in V5, but otherwise um, a sinus rhythm without conduction um, abnormalities. So the patient started to exercise and at peak exercise, which was at about six minutes and 30 seconds, as soon as we got into the third stage of a Bruce protocol, he developed um, this tracing. Um, anybody want to comment in the chat box on what they see? Yes, yeah, so we do see ST elevations in a non-Q wave lead in lead V4 and V5 here. You can see them here and here. Excellent. So the, the test was about to be stopped. Actually, so, okay, what do you do? Continue the test, repeat ECG tracing. Patient not at peak heart rate, add regadenosine, stop the test, inject regadenosine, inject systemic Excellent. So majority or, or not majority, all responses here are three for stopping the test. So if you see ST segment elevations in non-Q wave leads, leads, please stop the test. Do not, do not inject RAG. Do not continue the test. Do not keep going. Actually, this patient, as soon as we stop and put, that, put them on uh, the stretcher from the treadmill, you can see here what they develop. This is actually what you can see. They'll directly torso out the plants. And, and, and VF here. And so this patient was appropriately coded and shocked right away out of it. Luckily, the patient was young, did not have any other comorbidities, and actually recovered fairly quickly uh, during the code without needing intubation or any kind of support. So we were planning to send him to, to the cat lab. Uh, at the same time as we were doing this, the cat lab actually had another ST elevation, had two other ST elevations ongoing. We could not have a cat table right away, but the patient was chest pain free and had no other uh, symptoms. So we had actually the luxury of obtaining imaging um, at, uh, at that time while waiting for uh, a cat room to, to be um, available. So again, this is not something you would do uh, routinely when you have this and you, you when you see a finding like that with ST elevation and, and, and VF, you wouldn't send the patient to the imaging lab, you would send them to the cat lab, but here the patient was, was stable enough and we did not have a cat room available. That's why we, were, we had the luxury of obtaining this um, imaging study. So here traditionally you would see the stress images on top, the rest images um, on the bottom, uh, you have the short axis view on top, the horizontal long axis, and the vertical long axis here. Um, Aldo, do you want to help me with this? Yes. Thank okay. you. We have a, a rest first uh, acquisition here, and what is uh, impressive is we have uh, this uh, large uh, uh, defect and the stress, uh, uh, or not the stress kind of acquisition along the LED kind of distribution, I think it's of uh, severe intensity. Good, excellent. So large defect uh, that's reversible in the entire interior and interoceptal wall. He had an angiography. This is a still shot from the angiography and you can see a proximal LAD. Someone in the, in the chat box mentioned that, that, is, that they spiked the proximal LAD and that was right. Uh, the patient was stented and had um, good results and did well. Um, after this. As another example, this is a 75 year old gentleman referred for an exercise tolerance test for exertional angina and they developed um, ST depressions here as you can see here, here and here. And so when you see, and these ST depressions you can see they're not trivial. They're actually pretty deep. They're at least two millimeters deep here you can see them here and here as well. And so when you see significant EKG changes, um, ST elevations or deep ST depressions, you wanna stop the test. 
don't worry so well do we have the tracer or not if the tracer is available and technologies is available and you want to inject that's fine but don't delay stopping the test don't delay oh are we going to get a good test or no if you have st significant st changes please stop the test remember that if you see st elevations in specific leads those are localizing st depressions are not localizing for the uh, uh, the stenosis uh, when you stop the test, assess the patient for symptoms, are they, how they're feeling, chest pain, just on exertion, or lightheaded, or dizzy, and continue monitoring their blood pressure and, and uh, ECG tracings for arrhythmias. If their blood pressure allows, you can give them sublingual nitroglycerin and as well as metoprolol. If the blood pressure and if they're not is is uh, is is there, and if you if they're not bradycardic, and then. Make sure, again, that communication is important to contact the primary cardiologist, the cat lab, or the emergency room to let them that you have these high-risk patients there. In terms of ventricular tachycardia, recurrent non-sustained VT or sustained is actually um, a concern. You can see it polymorphic in patients having the butamine. Again, if you see this, you want to stop the test right away, assess the hemodynamic status. And then you can check if this is an artifact. If you have someone exercising and you see tracing that that could be VT or artifacts, if you can't make up your mind quickly, just err on the side of caution that this is more this is VT. Stop it, and you can always repeat the test if you, this was an artifact. But otherwise, you don't want to let someone run continue to run if they're having ventricular tachycardia. Hypotension is often during a exercise is often related to hypovolemia. Um, often patients are asked to remain um, NPO overnight and so they don't have appropriate PO intake and that's why they could be hypotensive and, and, um, and develop hypotension, though the normal response is that most people will increase their blood pressure, usually resolved with PO intakes and IV fluids. Um, if it happens later in exercise or with other ischemic findings, it can indicate significant coronary artery disease. If you see, it's not uncommon uh, with vasodilator agents. Other uh, complications that you can see in the stress lab are syncope or false, so always prioritize safety. So if you see someone who has a uh, poor balance or poor gait on the treadmill, just stop the test and try to see if you can do another kind of, uh, of testing. Um, evaluate the hemodynamic status, check for arrhythmias, to, that could explain why they're, 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 uh, they have this syncope. And always make sure to assess and document in the chart if there is any trauma that is sustained in the stress lab. You might, depending on your hospital policy and practice, you might need to fill an incident report, but always make sure you document that in the patient's um, chart. And if any concerns, you can always con refer the patient to the emergency room and also, again, contact the primary referring cardiologist. So in terms of vas vasodilator agents, uh, we use most often uh, regadenosine or adenosine. Regadenosine is a specific A2A adenosine receptor uh, uh, blocker. It is a standardized uh, dosing uh, using 0.4 milligrams per 5 ml. We usually inject it over 10 seconds. The half-life is rather uh, short. It has two, the half-life has actually two, uh, two phases. The first uh, uh, phase is rather short, two to three minutes. And then and there is an intermediate and final phase of up to two hours for its um, uh, half-life. Adenosine um, is, is a specific A2A receptor, but can affect either A1, A2B, and A3 receptors as well. It is a weight-based infusion over four minutes at 140 mics per kg per minute. The half-life is less than, than 10 seconds. It rarely requires reversal uh, given the sh how short the half-life is. Um, the reversal agents we use is aminophilin. It is a non-selective adenosine receptor blocker. We use it at a dose of 1 to 1.5 mg per kg, and we use it as a slow push uh, over 60 to 90 seconds. It has to be drawn for the bottle, so you want to make sure you have your syringes and your equipment ready if you're going to, if you're going to use that. And often in patients in whom you suspect or they had a pre previously described reaction with the vis dilator, you could draw the aminophilin before uh, 
and have it ready uh, before you conduct uh, the test. With adenosine or regadenosine, you could, you could see um, uh, conduction abnormalities. This is an example of a patient who received adenosine. Uh, you could see on the, on the pre-test EKG that there were no significant conduction abnormalities. Maybe the PR interval was a little prolonged, but otherwise the QRS was narrow. And then with, during the adenosine infusion, it started to develop some uh, two to one blocks here and they're persistent blocks that lasted for several blocks, the infusion was stopped. And as soon as we stopped it, there was re, uh, a normal sinus rhythm um, after that. Um, in terms of high degree AV block, it is more common with adenosine than the regadenosine. You can continue the infusion if it's well tolerated by the, by the patients, often making the patient move their hands and arms and, or, and do hand grips and or their feet on the stretcher can help alleviate that and, and recover from that. Otherwise, if the patients start to become symptomatic or their uh, blood pressure starts to drop or the AV block is persistent, you wanna stop the infusion right away and, and, and monitor them. If it's, again, with adenosine, you don't have time to give them uh, aminophilin. By, by the time you have it ready, they, the, the adenosine is completely eliminated from their, uh, from their system. If you use regadenosine or dipyridamol, then you can use aminophilin as your reversal um, agents. Um, these are the indications for reversal of regadenosine infusions. Um, so severe hypertension, development of symptomatic, persistent second degree or complete heart block, if patient develop wheezing, severe chest pain with SE depressions are of two millimeters or greater, signs of poor perfusion, technical problems with the monitoring equipment and a patient's request, request to stop the infusion. As mentioned, um, regadenosine and, and adenosine are uh, adenosine receptor blockers and they can occasionally uh, provoke um, bronchospasm. And so patients can have dyspnea or wheezing with this. So it's appropriate. It's very important to screen, appropriately screen your patients uh, before the test. Uh, if patients who had a recent COPD or with asthma exacerbation or have react, active airway disease, you wouldn't have that, let them go with the test. Um, if they patients who develop dyspnea or wheezing, you give them albuterol via, via the nebulizer. Um, and you can refer to the emergency room for management of their um, uh, shortness of breath. Another finding that we saw, uh, we learned over the last few years with regadenosan is the, the risk of seizure. And the theorized uh, phenomenon is that regadenosan might lower the seizure thresholds in patients who are at risk of seizures. So usually we screen for history of seizures and for patients who are taking medications, seizure medications, or who had recent breakthrough um, uh, through their medications. And it could be any types of seizures. It, it doesn't have to be just the tonic clonic um, uh, seizures. So regadenosine and seizures, aminophilin might also provoke seizures activity. So we don't use it, use it routinely if we have that. You could, you, you, what you would need to do is manage the seizure as you would uh, any kind of seizures. And so benzos are the primary uh, line. Uh, you wanna stabilize the patients, transfer to the emergency room, call the neurologist or the PCP um, uh, appropriately. And uh, it is possible that adenosine might have a similar risk to, to regadenosine, but though at this point, um, it, it is unclear. So with all these complications, you know, you want to go back to the basics and fundamentals, which is appropriate risk stratifications of patients, appropriate selection of your patients. Um, and so you want to check for contraindications, absolute and relative contraindications. So on the left-hand side, you have the absolute contraindications. And so those are things that you wouldn't want the patients um, to have their stress that they had an acute MI, they're high risk, unstable angina, um, uncontrolled arrhythmia, severe symptomatic uh, aortic stenosis, acute PE myocarditis or pericarditis, or an undergoing acute aortic, aortic dissection. Those are fairly common, but but you know it's good to remember them, and these patients should not undergo an exercise stress test. And then there are relative contraindications, meaning that these these patients could go with this, um, but um, you would need to uh, discuss it on a case by case and see whether the risk, the, the benefits outweigh the risk or not. 
Um, so someone asked, so you stress a patient with a blood pressure of 195. So, you know, like anything else, we put a threshold at 200 over 110, but um, uh, if someone is coming with a blood pressure of 195, 190, 185, we don't automatically stress them. We might let them rest, we might keep checking their blood pressure, see if it goes down. But obviously if someone come in with uncontrolled high blood pressure, uh, we wouldn't stress them. We would reschedule the tests and contact the primary care physician to see if there is any need for, to adjust their blood pressure um, uh, medications. Uh, occasionally, it, it is patients who did not take their morning blood pressure pills when they show up to the lab. And so we might need to reschedule, either if they have their, their medications with them, we have them take them and wait and then and, and, and take their blood pressure again. Or if they don't, we just reschedule the test and have them take their blood pressure medications before they come in. Um, these are the absolute indications for early termination of the uh, of exercise. These are available in several resources. This is from circulation in 2013, but often um, these are absolute indications. So anything that in increase the risk of complications. So ST segment elevations um, in, in non-Q wave leads, drop in systolic blood pressure. If patients develop moderate to severe angina, central nervous system, signs of per uh, uh, perfusion, sustained arrhythmias, or heart blocks, as well as the inability to safely monitor um, the patients. So in summary, you wanna avoid the situation. So proper selection of patients and, and review the indications and contraindications for every patient. Um, ask for help whenever uh, you need to. So you can rely on experienced exercise physiologists, technologists, senior fellows and attendees if you're in, in a teaching in, in institution. And always be ready. Don't be dismissive. Don't, don't, don't think that every test, I mean, we, 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 we described that there are less than five in 10,000 uh, uh, risk of complications, but you don't want to be handling those fives. So uh, one of those five cases. So always be ready. Make sure you follow protocols. You have your, your, your uh, and you're on the lookout for any kind of complications. So this is the first part of our talk, and then we're gonna review um, some um, uh, cases now. Um, uh, Dr. Scanoni, one of our uh, advanced fellows, is gonna help me with this. He's been instrumental in collecting some of the, the, these uh, cases. And so um, hopefully this will work well. I will be going back and forth between this, um, this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation and our uh, image and viewing software. Um, hey, hey, Sham, Sharmila yes. here. Uh, it's an excellent topic. Uh, thank you very much. While you set up for the cases, I see a number of questions on the chat. Could you take a few minutes to maybe answer a few questions? Maybe not all, but at least a few of them, and then we can get back to the cases. Sure, absolutely. Sure. Yes, no, that, that's a great suggestion. So. Um, We'll have, can you please comment on protocols and Duke's score? Thank you. All right, so th there are several protocols that can be using for exercise testing. The one we use most often um, in our lab is the Bruce, the three minute stages Bruce protocol, um, starting at, um, at 1.5 miles per hour and 10% uh, incline and going up every three minutes in steep in uh, the incline and the speed. Uh, there are, um, you can start with a modified Bruce protocol in patients who have low exercise capacity to start with or frail patients. And we often use the athlete protocol um, in patients who we might see would benefit uh, from that. The main thing is really standardization so that you can compare patients, compare patients, monitor serial changes in their patients and their functional capacity and use an, an, a protocol that has been validated and where you can quantify your metabolic equivalents as well. Um, let's see, uh, what other questions? Uh, can you give NEP treatment before start if they do have uh, wheezing? So we, we tend to that's that's a possible, but we tend to say that if patients are actually having active wheezing, uh, maybe we should not give them a vasodilator adenosine or regadenosine at that time, uh, and maybe let them first of all stabilize before we would um, we would give them uh, something that might complicate um, things. Absolutely. Could I add something here, please? Um, if a patient has exercise-induced asthma, 
We typically ask them to take their naps before starting the treadmill. I fully agree with uh, Dr. Scali about vasodilator, but if it's an exercise test and the patient has a history of exercise-induced wheezing, those are the cases where you might use a nap before starting the treadmill test. Any other interesting questions uh, there on the chat box? Uh, yeah, actually, I uh, uh, think a common question that has been uh, there a couple of times is uh, for HCM. Um, you know, exercise versus versus vasodilator. Um, you know, what's kind of if we have any recommendation on that one? That's a very good question. So often we would rely on the pre-existing echocardiogram data actually before uh, using that. So um, if there is a, a gradient. Um, and if the echo has shown before that there was a significant gradient with exercise, then we might uh, shy away from that. We would often monitor patients for, um, for uh, uh, what is their baseline blood pressure, what happened during echo, their echocardiogram and their history. And it depends on the indication uh, for, for the test. We have used both exercise and vasodilator in this patient, but usually it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think there is a standard uh, statement that would say use only exercise or only vasodilator um, in this patient. You want to look at their history and their other uh, finding that, uh, that you have in these patients. Anything else there? All right, so I think that um... excellent. So we'll start with the first case here. Um, so these cases are all are all anonymized. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second, and and share again. All right, so. We're gonna read these as we traditionally do in our uh, reading sessions. We will start with the imaging findings and then go back to the clinical findings and then get it together and see what other additional data uh, we might have here. So this is a standard nuclear test uh, uh, with uh, stress images on top and rest images on the bottom. There are two rows of stress imaging and the rest uh, images here. Um, Aldo, do you want to take this first one? And yeah, then we, absolutely, absolutely. And then, and then I, I, opening up to the rest of, of the yeah. audience here. And I think that's a, this is a great opportunity to also uh, show the, the whole audience how kind of what's the flow that we use here in the nuclear lab in terms of how, how we do it, uh, which is might be similar in, in some, some things, uh, maybe a little different to other areas uh, in other part of the country in the world. So I guess, uh, you know, Thomas is, uh, is, I guess, is the first thing that we, uh, we go to for the raw kind of uh, pictures. You can uh, give me Thomas or Scali. Sure, here they are. Okay, I, I think here um, it's important to look, uh, I mean, we, we use the, the deep D spec, so uh, we have kind of, a, uh, you know, simultaneous acquisition from multiple detectors. Uh, so it's not like the, the, the two head cameras in which you can have a lot of motion. So that's why uh, you see in the rotating tombo that it's a pretty still kind of uh, rotating picture. Uh, it's just because nothing is rotating, it's just acquiring at the same time through multiple uh, detectors. So um, what we focus here uh, on is uh, uh, primarily on the presence of activity outside the heart in the, in the thoracic cavity, uh, which I hear is not necessarily uh, uh, the best of the picture, but I don't see anything uh, gross there. Uh, there's some uh, activity uh, below the diaphragm, which is, uh, is common, we call, common, uh, commonly see. Um, and then some, sometimes we can uh, assess if there's anything in terms of diaphragmatic or, or breast uh, uh, coming over. I think in this guy, male, uh, perhaps there's a hint that maybe a diaphragm, but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm not too confident about that. But uh, no extra cardiac uh, intrathoracic activity there. So uh, then um, we like to go to, uh, to assess size of uh, ventricle. Um, here at uh, a face value, uh, um, the LV looks a little uh, on the dilated side. Um, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge that in 4DM you have the option to zoom in or zoom out. So if you randomly zoom in or zoom out uh, in a non-systematic way, you might make the ventricle look bigger or smaller as you, as you want. So I think it's important to kind of uh, have that uh, in mind. Uh, here from, a, from an uh, RV standpoint, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, I don't see well the RV. Uh, we see maybe some in the average central point, but I think for now, 
we'll see later in the gated acquisition, but you know, mildly dilated LV uh, uh, from a size perspective. Uh, I don't think that the cavity is changing between rest and stress. Um, from a perfusion standpoint, I think there's, there's, there's a couple things that are here that are interesting. Um, as as um, you know, we focus on the stress first um, uh, and we see uh, that um, you know, towards the apex, uh, we don't see uh, much there. Um, I, then my eyes goes down to the BLA, which is a better um, you know, uh, projection. We can see more of the apex and we see that there is a, a, a perfusion defect of uh, kind of a medium size perfusion defect uh, of severe intensity uh, and, and the distal anterior involving the apex and kind of the, in the septum that when you compare to the rest is, uh, is, is, pre is pretty fixed. So we see that um, again, a, a medium size uh, uh, defect of severe intensity uh, uh, in the kind of the distal LED distribution. However, uh, I think that's an important point there is that we see that, uh, you know, the, the septum is not involved. So if you are uh, uh, thinking on an LED, uh, I guess that uh, that would kind of involve the distal septum and, and the apex here is spare. So that's when you start thinking about uh, a kind of a diagonal uh, vessel in there. Um, so it's, it's easy to kind of focus your attention on the, on the I guess on the, on the worst defect that you see there, uh, but you always need to be systematic and try to look into other areas, make sure you don't miss anything. Uh, and one thing that uh, I guess catches my attention, um, Dr. you mind if you um, move a little bit just to have the, the different, uh, all the slides in the same row? Yes. Um, so um, one thing, Aldo, thank you for this. Um, I just want to pre clarify for the audience. We're having two rows of stress because one is a stress supine, which is a top row, and the other one is a stress upright, which is the middle row. And then the rest upright is the, is the bottom row there. Correct. And, um, and, and the reason I, sorry that I didn't explain that, is just that we use the, uh, the D spec, which is we, we rely on changing on position. We don't have kind of CT attenuation. So you're gonna see exactly that, two rows of stress and one of rest at the bottom. Uh, the second thing that I see is that uh, if you focus your attention now down to uh, kind of the base and the mid, um, you see that the uh, basal and mid inferior lateral wall has a decreasing count in the stress acquisitions in both. Uh, so it's not something that changes with position. And we compare that to the rest acquisition, which is a lower dose because that was done uh, first. It seems there is some reversibility suggesting there is a, a medium size of, of ischemia um, uh, of kind of moderate intensity uh, at the that kind of uh, you know, area that I would localize to a kind of an OM uh, kind of territory. Um, so, um, you know, that's, so I, I guess just to conclude, I think there's two, two defects and then that kind of localize uh, yes. to, to, to um, a multi-vessel distribution, two distributions. One is probably a distal, uh, you know, LED distribution, uh, probably a diagonal since the septum is spare and it's a fix for all NMI and then uh, kind of ischemia in the in OM territory. So if we go to the gate and now, um, So here we have kind of the gated. Uh, we always pay attention to uh, our end diastolic volume and stress, which is again, it, it kind of matches with our impression that was a mildly dilated LV. Uh, um, uh, we see here that, of course, that uh, you know, epical segment that we're kind of referring to, the epical anterior, uh, we have no counts in there. So, um, you know, suggesting that there might be kind of, you know, a world motion normality there. Uh, some people say that when you have no count, then it's hard to kind of report that. But, um, um, and then, uh, you know, on the basin inferior lateral, I guess that uh, that seems to be, uh, you know, uh, ticking in and, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, you know, moving, uh, you know, uh, kind of okay there. Uh, maybe at the meet, maybe a little. Although let me just fix this, mm -hmm. and I think our audience is going to see live how we process these images. And in the meantime, and the other comments I'd like to make um, about the change in position, um, uh, uh, that uh, we, yes, indeed, you're right. We do supine and upright here because this is the camera we have. Other cameras will have a prone and supine imaging, but I think this all follows the guy, the statement guy from the ASNIC about when you do spec imaging, you want to do multi-position uh, imaging. So I think that's uh, where this uh, comes from and that's what, what's important. So the other thing that we do here is we check our alignment, we check our mitral annulus plane here and um, which will give us uh, 
a better assessment of the LV volume in terms of actual quantification. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's very important. And we mentioned that in the first session that, um, I mean, you can make the EF that you want. So, you know, it's just not about the number, it's what about the number and what you actually are looking also on the, on the, the dynamic and the gated, sorry, uh, uh, images. So that they should kind of correlate. Uh, and again, the same for kind of, uh, um, you know, when you're analyzing these, so. And so uh, one thing to realize here also is that when you have a, a severe defect such as in here, you know, the, the camera is tracking counts that you may not actually see. So the volumes might be off uh, when you have severe defect, right? So I think that's the thing to realize in severe fixed defect here, the, the camera is making up this contour here. And so the actual volume might be uh, a little off. The EF might be correct, but the actual volumes might be a little off between uh, in both systole and, and um, diastole. So always um, keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Very good. So, uh, yeah, one thing yeah. I sometimes I like to use with you know the RV, sometimes it's hard to see in spec, uh, but I, sometimes I use the uh, MPI summary. Uh, I don't know if you have it uh, handy there. Uh, yeah, I kind of give you less uh, images. Uh, I think for the LV, we like to see it uh, in all the cards here. And I tend to use uh, the grade scale uh, embedded. And, and um, so that kind of give you a, a better look at, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the movement and the thickening. And, uh, you know, I zoom out a little bit just to see the RV and see if there's uh, anything that uh, is worth mentioning. Um, Maybe here, I mean, we can, uh... Good, so thank you, Aldo, for this excellent interpretation. I had this other uh, screen captures from that, but this was a 61-year-old gentleman with history of hypertension, smoker, and non-obstructive CAD uh, on prior assessment who presented with chest pain and downtrend in cardiac enzymes, and death spec was obtained showing that um, that uh, severe defect um, in the inferior anterolateral wall as well as in the um, uh, uh, inferior lateral wall. And this has his uh, catheterization film. These are just two shots that we shot here. Do you want to comment on these? Uh, yeah. So I guess that uh, one of the things that we we're thinking is, uh, in this guy is coming with down trending enzymes and everything. There was, I guess, remember this case was kind of concerned for a mystemi. So I guess the first one we see here is a, is an arocardal shot, and uh, we're taking out the left main um, that kind of bifurcates, and we see right away that the, you know, then the proximal area of the cirque is maybe you need to play it again perhaps um, is uh, severely uh, stenotic. Uh, which kind of uh, signal or kind of, uh, you know, matches with the, you know, the, this area of schema that we saw in the, you know, basal and mid kind of inferior wall extending all over to the apex. Um, and then on the other side, um, are you able to play that, Dr. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So then here saying we, we see it again. So, so we have, um, you know, that proximal uh, circus, uh, severely stenotic. Uh, there's a 1OM that wants to kind of come out of that, which is, seems to be uh, kind of occluded, and then we, we have kind of a, a large OM there. So that kind of explains the area of ischemia we're seeing. Uh, and the second shot, we have a kind of a spider view. We have kind of the LED coming to us, and we see two diagonals coming there. Um, you know, the first diagonal seems to be, have some disease in there, maybe something of the ostium, but more importantly, I think the second diagonal uh, is, is occluded at the mid-segment, and, uh, and that was, uh, f you know, uh, felt to be probably the, the culprit for the, the initial MI, uh, given the, the fixed effect in, the, in that diagonal distribution, which is, you know, really correlates nicely with uh, our, you know, our images. So the patient went after this, just, um, you know, went for, um, they decided to intervene into, into the circumflex. Good, thank you. So let's do our next case. And again, I'm gonna yeah, any uh, if, applications oh. here. Yeah, uh, if anyone from the from the audience, you know, is wants to kind of uh, take a shot, then you know, uh, feel free to uh, either uh, raise your hand virtually or just kind of uh, make a comment in the chat, and we can unmute you guys. Uh, should be pretty fun. All right. So, hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry. So while we wait for that, um, um, let me see if there's uh, 
I'm so, having trouble with this next case on Hermes, so I'm going to show it on my slides here. Yeah. So I, uh, in the meantime, Do you I see this? I, yeah, we see it. Okay. I guess, uh, let me answer some question here that I saw here that, um, you know, upper, upper limit of diastolic. So we use the diastolic volume index. Um, I mean, there's different references. Uh, the one that we use uh, as, a, as a kind of a reference is different for male and females. Uh, we tend to use, uh, uh, you know, 70, 70 71 uh, uh, for males and kind of 53 for females. But again, this is, these are kind of references, uh, but also we take into account how the, the ventricle look, how the LB look compared to the RV. So just to answer that question. Okay, we can, you know, uh, go to the next. Um, who is, uh, is anyone uh, interested in just take this, uh, take this case? I saw someone's hand raised. Okay, let me see. see. Excellent. I can read it. It's Monica. Okay. Oh, All right. Monica. Excellent. I'm one of the first year cardiology fellows from the Brigham. Um, so I guess we'll start with the TOMOs. Or we don't have them? No. I don't have them on this. I'm trying to get it open on the other side. So okay. Sorry about this. No, no. So then, um, so I see stress, uh, two stresses on top and the rest. I'm guessing it's um, upright, supine, and then upright? Yep. Um, and then looking um, just globally, it looks like um, the heart doesn't look enlarged. It's all fitting in that uh, top row. Um, and then trying to look at the RV, I don't see any increased RV uptake in rest or stress. Um, and then I do, you know, I see globally maybe more increased count in the rest. Maybe just it might be relative, but um, and then maybe something in the at the base, the infralateral wall. Excellent. Very, very good, uh, Monica. Yes, so there is a little bit of a very subtle uh, decreased in count that you can see in the basal and mid inferior lateral walls. You could see it both on the stress upright and the stress supine. And if you compare it to the rest images, it's not there. You can see it both on the short axis as well on, on the HLA. You could see it here. Uh, if you can follow my uh, pointer in the inferior lateral here, here, here and here, and it's reversible when you compare it to the um, uh, rest imaging. Uh, very good. These are the um, gated images. So a lesson for the fellows, uh, guys, is always, um, well, whenever you can, try to have a backup plan. This was my backup plan to have this uh, slides ready, and Aldo helped me prepare these. Um, so thank you, Aldo, for having these. Um, uh, ready for us. Yeah. So um, you can see here that in terms of motion, uh, Monica, do you see any obvious uh, wall motion abnormalities here? Or would you um, see any? I think I do. I mean, it, uh, oh, it's tough. Um, it, it's tough because there's less counts that are stressed in the infralateral wall, but I do think looking at the center, I do think there's a little bit of a wall motion abnormality in that same infralateral area in the mid and base. Yeah, good. So yeah, so decreased counts um, are a problem there, but otherwise uh, no uh, LV size appears to be normal and um, a little bit of the inferolateral wall as we described with, with decreased counts there. So this was a 62 year old female with hypertension, hyperlipidemia and known coronary disease presented with acute onset of chest pain while at work. Uh, and the pain was uh, evolving and actually severe. Her troponins were negative, uh, but given the, the, the findings of the, of the MIBI, um, she ended up having a catheterization. And uh, let me see if we can play this. Yeah, I guess that I can, uh, you know, the first thing that kind of I guess strike there uh, is that something is missing on that uh, caudal shot. I guess uh, in occasion you can have a different ostia and then that's why you kind of selectively engage in the, you know, the LED system, but uh, you know, um, um, that was not necessarily the case here. Uh, you know, we see that the, the LED system is, is, uh, is pretty unremarkable. Uh, and, uh, but in the last uh, panel, I guess you see that the, 
uh, the, we see that the circumflex is actually coming from the right. Um, you know, um, the osteum of the, uh, here we don't see well, but in, in some other projections uh, was, uh, was clear. Um, so no, no epicardial disease to kind of explain this, this area. I think as a disclaimer, uh, you know, we know that uh, the circumflex coming from the right is, is, uh, is regarded as a benign uh, in anomalous origin uh, because it, you know, tend to go posterior to the aorta. Um, you know, but in this case, uh, you know, interestingly for what is what, uh, you know, kind of localized to the same area of what we're seeing, what we're seeing the kind of ischemia. And then uh, there was no area of compression or kinking, at least in, the, in some of the kind of images that we got, but, you know, um, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, and then she was, you know, of course, managed medically. Good, thank you. Yeah, so that's uh, a good case of a subtle finding there, possibly related to the anomalous left circ. Um, and then we're gonna go to the next case. I think I was able to get um, uh, our uh, viewing system working. Yeah. So let me stop that there. Yeah, and, and Doctor, let me know if you want me. I can probably jump in and just, uh, you know, I can help. I'm opening them to you too. All right. Do you guys see this? Yeah, perfect. Can you see all all the rows? Yep. All right. Excellent. So, um, so what kind of study is this? Anyone can 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 jump in. Um, it's a pet, excellent, yes. So um, I'm glad um, this is uh, obvious. And so uh, with pet imaging, we would start by looking at our fusion images here. And so this is part of our quality assurance to ensure that we are our pet. And so, um, Emission images are well aligned with our transmission images from the CT. And you can see there that it appears correct on the transverse view. Here on the sagittal view also. And on the coronal view. We can use heart orientation here and do the same thing, but these are these look good. All right. So in the interest of time, we're going to go directly to our um, perfusion uh, images. Nicolaos, you want to take that? Excellent. Thank you. Go ahead. Let me unmute you. I have to find you. Um, yeah, hi. You're on. Excellent. Yeah, hi. Uh, hello from Cleveland. Um, hi, Nicole. How you. are you? Hi, Aldo. Great. Um, so we can see in the, in the stress images there is... Um, at least like a moderate to severe intensity um, inferior um, infer apical inferior um, and uh, inferoceptal defect extending all the way to the mid um, and basal wall. Um, I would uh, say it's, uh, we can see the vertical long axis views that they, again, the, the inferior wall uh, reversible defect um, that corrects with, uh, you know, in the rest images. Um, so I think this is more consistent with um, uh, RCA territory ischemia. I think the LV cavity is a little um, more dilated uh, with stress overall. Right. The, the RV uptake looks the same to me, um, but uh, I'm a little worried about, uh, you know, uh, some TID with stress and um, RCA ischemia. The anterior wall looks fine. Um, yes. Yeah. So indeed, you are correct, Nico. Thank you very much. So yes, yeah. the inferior wall here, as you can see, the inferior inferior septum is decreased, has decreased count here. But you can also notice that the inferior lateral also has decreased counts in and more so in the basal area, but all the way up to the mid uh, territory. You can see it also here, here, and here. Um, and um, and so that's what we got here. You can see it also on the gray scale. And you can see these findings here and here. I think if you look at the, 
So do you mind if I comment something here that um, yes, please. Is, is, uh, I think is very striking and, and sometimes it's, uh, it's important when you're looking at the nuclear uh, test, not only to focus necessarily on the heart, but just also always look at outside. In this case, uh, one thing that caught, uh, caught, caught my attention is that around the heart, you see this uh, area of completely absent counts uh, uh, around the heart. Um, this, uh, in occasion, we see that it's a predominant fat uh, but in certain cases, when you zoom out, you might see that and might in, in a little swinging, it might be actually uh, kind of a, 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 a pericardial effusion. So, I mean, it's important, uh, we'll see perhaps in the CT, just confirm that, but um, we often see with fat, but you know, it's nice to kind of take a little bit of step back and just uh, take a look from the you know, big picture and make sure you don't miss anything outside your heart. Yes, so you did have a big pleural effusion as well. Uh, I'm just gonna show the gated images here quickly, and then we'll move on to. So you can see the decrease sticking in in the inferior wall here. And in the inferior septum, these are the polar maps here. Showing these two territories are completely reversible. Um, I think we do. We I don't think I, I'm sorry because I had to restart this whole thing, so I don't have our CFR uh, data available here. But I can make them available offline later on as needed. Um, and, and one thing that I guess, uh, Charlie, that I see also here, uh, we're talking about uh, some of the you know silhouette around the heart is that I mean we see some some degree of lung uptake. Uh, this is uh, yes. ammonia, uh, and uh, you know that freely diffuses. And then, you know, we, I guess if you have a stress, a predominantly uh, or worse, uh, you know, uh, lung uptake during stress, we always are, are, wor are worried about severe ischemia. We increase LVDP, but we see often that uh, you know patients that are let's say smoker have kind of chronic lung disease. Uh, we tend to see that uh, you know both in rest and stress might have a little bit of an increased uh, uptake. Ammonia, as, as ammonia also freely diffuses, and then you, in, in people who have not compensated from a heart failure standpoint, has a lot of edema in the lungs, we might see also a little bit of, you know, uh, you know, diffusion of the ammonia tracery in there. So I just want to comment a little bit on the outside the heart kind of findings. Good. Um, so uh, uh, one comment here by one of the audience about can we include in the future the final reports, obviously without identifiers, so we can see how these are reported. I think it's a good suggestion for the future speakers, for Dr. Darbala as well, um, just in terms of uh, not only interpretation of the images, but also reporting is important as stressed out by um, ASNIC. So I think that's a good um, suggestion. Um, and then this patient, I believe, Oh, uh, here is, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to my slides here. And actually, we had a screenshot of the floor reserve here and you can see that the patient had uh, I hope you can see this had to reduced uh, flows in, in all three coronary um, arteries. Uh, you can see a gradient going from the proximal LAD into the distal LAD that this was significantly reduced and similarly in the other um, arteries as well. Um, this was a 78 year old gentleman with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, atrial fibrillation with a pacemaker and AFib with worsening exertional dyspnea, had a prior uh, PCI to left circ and OM, and now had this regadenosine scan, and we have some shots of his um, CAT films as well. Yeah, and I can uh, chime in here. I think uh, this, this case is pretty, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very nice case in, in, uh, for a few things, but in particularly for the, you know, the, the capacity to, that we have to localize. So if you remember, on the on the perfusion, we saw that yes, as as Nico pointed out well, like that, those those reversible perfusion defect involving the inferior, but also kind of the lateral wall, and we saw there was kind of a little bit of an island uh, of uh, uh, tracer uptake. Uh, 
uh, that can, you know, uh, you know, challenge a little bit on how you describe that, but, uh, you know, right away you need to kind of think or suspect that maybe there's some perfusion to that in between areas. So we're talking about uh, potential multivessel uh, uh, disease, especially in the setting of the TID. And then I guess here, uh, we nicely see in this arrow caudal that um, you see that um, in the main circ appears to have some disease, but not the Cinegra, but the, the second OM after like that first OM is, is actually occluded. Uh, uh, and then the third OM really kind of goes around and wraps around and, and, and kind of provides some of the, the, uh, the more of the lateral. Uh, there's some collaterals going to the, you know, to the right. So the LAD was the middle one was like some mal diffuse and then we'll focus here on the right the right is occluded after giving that kind of uh, large marginal. So I guess, uh, you know, how this correlates with the findings, we see that that kind of reversal perfusion defect that we saw in the inferior wall in involving into the septum, as Nicole described, was probably coming from that occluded, uh, uh, you know, that kind of RCA CTO. Um, and then the more lateral, uh, um, you know, defect was probably from the, from the OM with that kind of OM tree probably in between. So I guess uh, it's really amazing how the technology have kind of this kind of impressive resolution in terms of kind of localized things. Uh, excellent. And then Thank um, you. Uh, for like, uh, sorry, C, uh, PCI for, uh, you know, um, for these two territories with good, uh, good uh, uh, you know, uh, results. Uh, excellent. So let's uh, go to our next case. And um, all right, so I have you back on my uh, viewing software. Can you guys see this? Yes, we see it completely. All right, excellent. Uh, so this is again a PET scan. Do we have any volunteer to take it? You guys are doing a great job so far. We had people from uh, several institutions already answer in and doing a great job at this. Uh, All right, so um, again, because this is a PET scan, we'll show the fusion images here. And we can have, we see that there is good. Okay, I think we have uh, one taker here. Um, and Michael? Hey, um, Michael Ayers from Penn. Oh, welcome. Hi. Thanks for helping out. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, high quality PET scan here. Uh, the rest studies look like we don't have any resting perfusion, perfusion defect, though I stared a little bit at the mid uh, anterior anterolateral wall there, but I think I ended up giving it a pass. And then moving to the stress studies on top, there's a pretty significant. Wait, are they both rest studies here? It's labeled as rest rest on the yeah. left. Yeah, that's the way it's labeled, but it's actually a stress on top. Yeah, it's okay. stress on top. You can see it here actually. And then uh, looking at the stress studies, there are two pretty large defects. The first starts along the basal anterior anterolateral wall and extends all the way down uh, almost to the apex. I don't think it's going to be in an LAD territory because the antiseptum is predominantly spared. So I think it's nice. probably going to be a, a Diag or a high-rising OM. Very uh, nice. And then I think the inferior wall, all the, the infraceptum, not quite at the base, but subbasilar, you start to get a defect at the RV insertion that continues to include the whole inferior wall all the way down to mid to apical segments. Um, I'm going to guess that that's not an RCA lesion because the basal, well, uh, I'll give you two options. Either it's a uh, a left circ that's supplying a lot of the inferior infralateral wall from mid to apical sections, or it's a PDA lesion that's actually happening uh, after the basal section of the, the PDA. So it's the, the PDA successfully supplying the basal infraceptum and then is occluded. I, I, I don't know which it is there, uh, but there's two lesions. And then the other thing to note is the RV uptake 
increases on the stress images, which is again consistent with multivessel disease. Good. Uh, this is a good interpretation. So uh, just zooming out to see, so you can see everything. So yes, multiple territories, though what you, what you appropriately and very correctly pointed out is that the septum is actually preserved. So this tells us that this is not a, a, um, a distal AD uh, uh, involvement. However, you can see that the interior wall is actually more severely affected proximally than distally. You can see that in the VLA. You can see the, yeah. the, mid, the proximal or basal segment and the mid segments are involved. <clears throat> but the distal segments and the true LV apex um, are not involved. So one thing to always consider when you have the, this is that, is there something that would explain why the perfusion is maintained distally and not proximally? And, and, and also the other thing, as you mentioned, is that would suggest uh, multivessel involvement is the dilatation of the cavity and the, uh, and the RV. Um, I'm gonna go to the uh, motion, to the gated images here. And so this is a moderately dilated uh, ventricle with mildly depressed, with moderately to severely depressed LV function with uh, hypokinesis and reduced thickening in those areas that we described earlier in the proximal, basal, and mid-anterior and anterior, and anterior lateral wall, as well as in the inferior and inferior septal wall. Uh, you can see that in the polar maps here as well. Um, Could you so, in the CFR? CFR, I do have that on a different screen. Give me just or the, or the CT, just because yeah. I imagine there's going to be a lot of calcium. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we'll get back to the CT, and then we'll get back to um, and even before we go there, I just want to make a comment, um, uh, which is, uh, I mean, I think Dr. Scali was pointing uh, towards that, is that um, in addition to the, the motion that we had, uh, there was, uh, what, what about the septum? Scali, uh, can you go back to the... Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. So, you know, I guess the septum here is, uh, is kind of moving with the RV, uh, you know, kind of in a more kind of paradoxical way, um, uh, you know, and that kind of with the, you know, I guess with the features that Dr. Scali was mentioning, pointing out that, uh, you know, this cell was preserved, but not proximally in a multi-vessel distribution, I guess you have to, uh, you know, wonder if this is, uh, you know, a case with a bypass, uh, coronary bypass, and this is a lima that is patent to the distal um, kind of LAD, and that's why you get in this kind of diagonal pattern, and you can get that right from, from the, you know, paradox of motion. Can, can you, know, you all just see that with the left bundle? Yeah, I think the differential for, for a paradoxical septal motion are, are few. I think one of them is, is uh, open heart surgery. Um, the second thing is uh, yeah, any conduction, particularly left bundle, uh, the synchrony. Uh, and some, some other uh, groups even uh, say that um, the, the, cent the, the, ma the center of the, the mass of the heart is actually the LD, is you have the more muscle. So that's why the septum moves towards the center of the LD. But in people who tend to have RV hypertrophy or dilatation and the mass the center of mass changes towards the RV. Uh, so you might have a little bit of a different or a you know, uh, septal motion. So, so again, uh, RV hypertrophy or you know, dilatation in, in disproportion to the LV might be you know, what some other people can all say, but classically it's just a conduction issue or, or a, you know, uh, open heart surgery. Good, excellent. So again, to summarize, we have these findings of uh, moderately depressed uh, LV function, moderately dilated LV and, and, uh, and RV. So it's always important to, to, to look at things, not focus just on the perfusion abnormalities, but look at the, all the findings that you can glean from a study, such a complete study. And one of the things that I haven't shown you here is the um, uh, CFR, and I'm gonna show you that here just to be complete. And this is what we got uh, in terms of um, CFR. And you can see that the peak flows are reduced. The reserve is also uh, low. And those in tend to involve the, the segments that we, that we mentioned. Um, this was a 67-year-old gentleman with history of coronary disease that is post-bypass surgery with lima to LAD and vein grafts. 
we presented with exertional chest pain who had uh, this PET scan and then had a, um, a catheterization after this. Yeah. And so what you see here is that, as you mentioned, um, uh, Mike, I think, was that, yes, the distal uh, LAD territory was preserved, and that was probably because the lima to LAD remains uh, patent, but the native LAD disease, there, there remains native LAD disease that's uh, consistent with the uh, abnormal perfusion uh, that we saw here. And this is what you see on the catheterization here in this uh, shot showing the left main and proximal um, LAD uh, findings. And then the vein graft to the uh, PDA is also, uh, there is a uh, significant lesion in the mid, uh, in the proximal portion of that vein graft that was also um, uh, stented. Great. One comment that I want to make now that we know we established that this is a bypass uh, uh, patient, um, you know, the interpretation of, of uh, macular blood flow as we're going to expand more in a, in a sub subsequent uh, series um, is, pre is pretty tough. So, so you cannot interpret the flow the same way that you do for other patient in patient with, uh, with bypass surgery. So. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your help. It's great. Good, so let's get ready for uh, the next case. It is. So I have it here as a screenshot. I'm sorry um, uh, that I don't have it ready on, on the Hermes station. I'm trying to do that in the background, but other, otherwise, um, I have this ready. So do we have a volunteer? This is a good quality scan. Do we have a volunteer for that? Anyone? Okay. Um, I guess Nico is, uh, Nico is the man. Nico, you got uh, a yeah, second I, I can shot. can try right. that. Sure. Thank you. Or um, nail. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So let's we can have Nail do it. Uh, yeah, now, now. Okay. Hey, now. Sure. Uh, thank you, Aldo. This is this is Nail. I'm uh, from Boston Children or Brigham. Uh, hey, thanks, man. Thanks for helping. Welcome. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, it does look like there is um, a reversible perfusion defect in the distal uh, in the distal anterior and uh, septal wall uh, that most likely reflect involvement of um, the, I would say the mid LED. Uh, you can see. What about the cavity size? On that, it's starting from frame 31. Uh, I think I think the, the cavity size also get uh, slightly uh, get slightly larger or dilated yes. from from rest to stress. So suggest that maybe maybe there is. Uh, uh, multivisceral involvement, but you don't see that on the on the on the on the perfusion images. Well, um, one thing that I, I if Niall, if you if you I, I agree with you that uh, there's this uh, um, you know large uh, and uh, severe uh, perfusion defect involving kind of the the LED territory, um, which is predominantly reversible. Take a look. Um, I mean, usually the the apical inferior you can get it from a wraparound LED. Um, try to kind of get you know your eyes out of the LED territory and just focus your attention maybe on the inferior septum and the inferior wall. Um, do you think that uh, you know I'm just kind of looking at this and, and and do you think that the inferior wall and the inferior septum is completely normal or or might be a little bit of uh, reversibility there? No, I think I think definitely the whole septum, uh, anterior septum yeah. and anterior septal, uh, the distal portion of that, uh, the whole yeah. septum, anterior and posterior. And since you mentioned uh, anterior and inferior, and since you mentioned it also the inferior wall, now looking at it, it does look like there is uh, there is decreased counts uh, yeah. when you go from rest to stress, suggesting there is also reversible perfusion defects um, uh, in the inferior wall in addition to the anterior and septal wall. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So it's, uh, I think yeah, you, uh, then multivessel involvement, including the mid LED and also the, R, the RCA. Yeah, perhaps, well. perhaps the RCA, yeah. Possibly. 
or wrap around RCA. Uh, I think, yeah, that's it. Uh, unless there are more, uh, more images you want to show on this study. Let's see, um, we have the gate there. So this is the... Um, I think, yeah, you can, you can see it fine. clearly here. Then. Oh, here it is. Okay. All right, so you can see here um, that there is decreased thickening in that same area with reduced wall motion and normality. I think here... No, okay. All right, and uh, again here, reduced flows uh, in that area, uh, reduced peak flows and reduced uh, reserve. Okay, so this, uh, this patient actually, um, he was, uh, the story goes that he was uh, presented with a symptom, he was referred actually for CT. And, uh, and then the CT, as you can see, there's, uh, uh, focusing on the coronaries, you can see there is a multivessel a severe coronary artery calcification. Um, on top of that, you see that maybe uh, it's not well appreciated here, but that he has a prior stent. And uh, if you can point that out to that area of the LEDs, is uh, actually we see an, an stent. Uh, that's a calcification if you keep going down. And then yeah, that, where, and stent, that, that you see there is a step up, that's where a stent. But then after that, um, uh, you know, the, the LED came up to kind of a, an occlusion and a CTO, and there's some re reconstitution distally. I think it's important to know, and, and this is not necessarily CT uh, conference, but in CT and current CTA, uh, you know, you might see reconstitution of the vessel uh, distally, even if you have a CTO, just because collaterals, they might look at it's patent. It's just because of the timing. You don't, you don't image after injection, you, you image like a little bit after, so you might see some reconstitution later, even if it's a CTO. So here was a CTO of the LED, and there was like, you know, classification in the other vessel was kind of hard to really determine uh, if there was, uh, you know, severe stenosis, particularly in the RC. So that's why they went for for um, for a, a nuclear stress test to kind of define uh, if there was any hemodynamic significant uh, occlusion uh, in the in this patient. So after these, uh, of course, it was for um, for uh, you know, um, and these are kind of the images already when you know prior to intervention. So it, because we have a good projection here, uh, they're, they're doing dual injection for a CTO intervention. But importantly, here what we see is that uh, that RCA is disease. Uh, particularly at the bifurcation point, uh, the PDA and the post which is a severe uh, stenosis there, uh, um, and something on the mid two. And then on the right panel, um, sorry, on the on the right panel, you see that better. And then on the left pa panel, uh, you see that the uh, LED is uh, filling by collaterals, uh, right to left collaterals in that kind of tready, uh, you know, LED. So again, correlating with the the two uh, vessel distribution that we saw as now correctly identify on the LED and then kind of the RCA and this patient went for uh, for PCI. I think this is a nice case in which we can differentiate from the prior ones in which we have sparing of that septum and that apex uh, suggesting that was either a diagonal or, or a potential uh, proximal LED with a bipatent bi lima to LED in contrary, in contrary to this case in which uh, it was you know involving the, the again the apex and the, and the septum in this study. So if you see the VLA projections here in the prior scan, we had mostly the defect in the basal and mid walls. Here we have the, the defect, which is more distal and involving the LV apex. And so really talking about the true LAD and the mid and the mid uh, LAD lesion. There's the other one was mostly native uh, LAD disease. And, uh, and I'm just gonna go back here because I think the, the, you can see here that the distal LAD portion was preserved and it was mostly the basal and, and mid LAD that was involved. And that was because the Lima to LAD was still patent. All right, very good. Um, I think we can squeeze in one more case. Is that okay, guys? Yeah, let's do it. And, and then right. actually, there was a, one question about the CT calcification versus 10. I mean, sometimes it's, uh, armor is, is, uh, is hard to, to differentiate, but if you feel it's a very human shape uh, mate, uh, then you might anticipate this in a stand. Sometimes you can see the struts, uh, you know, just by the shape you can, uh, you know, differentiate, you need to reconstruct, uh, you know, but sometimes it could be, uh, you know, challenging, especially if you have disease and calcification on top of the stand. Okay. All right, very good. Um, 
So this is uh, a 60 year old female with history of hypertension, type one diabetes, prior PFO closure following a TIA, who present with uh, progressive dyspnea on exertion and referred for a PET myocardial perfusion scan. And uh, let me show you her screen here. And I, um, this is a very, this is a bonus kind of uh, uh, case. It's a, it's a nice case and you know, I can, I can. So let's see if someone wants to interpret this PET perfusion scan here. Do you have anyone? Um, not yet. Anyone? Okay, Niall is uh, willing to uh, take on this case again. Good. Niall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Aldo. Um, so it, so it looks like uh, uh, from uh, uh, on, on these images, it looks like there is a fixed perfusion defect uh, on the anterior and the anterior septal wall you can see on the stress images at the base. Um, and uh, you can see, see that uh, that perfusion defect also uh, on the stress images on the proximal segments, um, and you see you don't see any 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 perfusion defects uh, on the on the distal uh, on the mid or distal segments. Um, so you would think maybe there is uh, uh, it doesn't fit any coronary distribution. Uh, so you would wonder if uh, if this is. Uh, if this if this just reflects some uh, myocardial disease process uh, beside coronary artery or beside ischemic beside uh, beside coronary artery disease, uh, so uh, good, uh, very good suggestion, uh, uh, Nile. So uh, yeah, so there is a, a perfusion defect here in the proximal portion of the of the anterior wall, scratching a little bit on the anterior septum and a little bit on the anterior lateral wall. Um, but uh, it, let's focus first on the size of the ventricle. So if we put this all the way to the apex here, you can see that this is taking roughly less than a row and a half in, in, in on this uh, uh, setting here. These, there is no evidence of TID. Um, this is probably an, a, a normal size ventricle. We can zoom out and look at the RV as well. And you can see that the RV remains a normal size. There is no decreased uptake of the RV um, in this um, uh, with, with stress. And then, as Nail mentioned, there is this perfusion defect that involves the basal anterior wall here, and that is predominantly um, uh, fixed. Um, it could be either a non-coronary distribution. The other, um, the other uh, thing to think about is, as we discussed in a prior case, is could this be a cabbage patient with a preserved Lima to LAD, and this is just an infarct in the proximal LAD territory uh, in the native uh, LAD uh, uh, portion. So uh, I, uh, we, we did show the history and we were honest this time. We did not hide anything from you that in the, in the sense that this, the patient had type one diabetes and hypertension, but we didn't hide from you that she had a history of uh, bypass surgery. So no, no history of bypass uh, surgery on this patient. Um, for the sake of completeness, uh, I'm gonna show you the gated images here. Oh, it's gonna need to be reprocessed. I'll give me just a second here. And I can, uh, you know, also provide. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, I see a lot of people kind of commenting on potential differentials there. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Either like, uh, you know, uh, again, Lima, and uh, we already went through that, and kind of diagonal some septal ablation. There was no septal ablation history as far as we knew. Um, one thing is that, um, I mean, what this can give you also, you have to be careful and we, we check for that, is that you, you make sure you have a, a, a normal, uh, appropriate uh, co-registration between the, the, the nuclear uh, images and the CT. Uh, if you have the, the anterior wall is going uh, out of the heart and into the lung, and uh, you might get, create a defect that it follows, uh, it doesn't follow a coronary distribution. So, so I think always have that in mind. Uh, yes, it can be real disease. It could be 
uh, ischemic or non-ischemic, or, or have your differentials open if it doesn't fit, but also uh, thinking artifacts like, uh, you know, uh, mere registration, which was, again, was not the case in this, in, in this particular patient. So LV cavity was normal overall, EF was normal to borderline, um, and then we see this anterior wall, basal anterior wall, uh, reduced, taken in and, and, and motion. Uh, no, on the CT, we did not see dextrocardia uh, there. All right, excellent. So uh, I think we have a good interpretation of the uh, description of the findings um, in the sense that we have a perfusion defect that's basal uh, in the LAD territory where without explanation of why this is not involving um, uh, the, uh, uh, the distal portion in a patient without prior bypass surgery. So, um, and I guess uh, uh, get back here. Yep. And so, with that, this patient had this is the CAT scan at the time of the PET, and you can see that there was no calcium. Yep. On the CT there, no coronary calcification there. You can see this is the LAD portion. There is no coronary calcification. There's nothing on the RCA. The aorta also is free of calcium. So nothing to suggest uh, calcified uh, plaque. Though this is, this older this patient has diabetes. Um, uh, she's still relatively young, so she could have non-calcified plaque. Um, but then she did have a coronary CT angiogram. Uh, I'm gonna play this for you, Aldo. Yes. I guess, uh, uh, yeah, so then, um, you know, we see here that, uh, you know, kind of left main and uh, bifurcates and, you know, pretty normal looking vessels on the left and on the right. We see an interatrial occluder, that's the device you're seeing there, but uh, overall it's uh, pretty clean coronaries. It's a right dominant and, and, you know, we don't see, when you reconstruct, you see that it's, uh, you know, all the vessels were painted, especially in that proximal ED in the perforator and so forth. That, that's a device that the occluder that she had yeah, for you know, PFO. I was showing that here. Um, but you know, again, no, no, no plaque whatsoever in in, in this case, um, uh, and and just um, you know, and this uh, CT kind of came after like the study. So with the way that we reported was that could potentially suggest uh, kind of coronary disease, but uh, you know, other differential. I think some people was kind of actually mentioned like potentially sarcoma and stuff like that. So it was included. So we actually advised the team to actually rule out obstructive disease, and that's why uh, the coronary CT was obtained just to. Uh, Good. So we have a few suggestions here. Uh, people mentioning non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, sarcoidosis, um, uh, PFO uh, closure complications, and so on. So um, normal LVEF, uh, dextrocardia. So we said no dextrocardia, as you can see on the CT. PFO closure complications, uh, not really. I mean, it would be either they're not close to the coronaries uh, there unless they actually would, would be able to touch uh, uh, the, uh, uh, any of the coronaries. But this is an entirely intracardiac uh, uh, procedure. Could they have an, embol an embolic phenomenon? But then that would go into a more distal uh, territory than, than, than this. Um, the next slide we have, so indeed, um, the other thing that was that remained on the differential, as mentioned by several people, is the sarcoidosis. So this patient did undergo uh, a PET FDG uh, scan, which is uh, show, uh, shown here. So we do have the rest scan on top and the FDG uh, on the second row. And this is an FDG following the sarcoid preparation diet. Uh, shall so, I, shall I? Yes. Uh, no, I was I was going to say that uh, it looks like there is FDG uptake as, as I think you were going to say the same thing. But there is a FDG uptake um, that match the perfusion defect on the on the on the on the on the perfusion images, suggesting possibly uh, inflam uh, active inflammation uh, and possible sarcoidosis. I guess. Yeah, very very good. So what I was saying is that this patient underwent uh, the pr preparation for uh, for sarcoidosis, and so with. Uh, a no carb uh, diet and high fat uh, diet with uh, eventually prolonged fasting prior to the scan. And this is an excellent quality uh, uh, scan uh, uh, as a description. And then as Niall described here, and as uh, I'll ask Aldo to uh, complete the description here uh, in terms of the uh, perfusion and metabolism um, findings. 
Yeah, no, and then I, w I just wanna, I we'll answer some of those questions that came through the chat, but yes, uh, I guess we're seeing that, uh, we're seeing the same uh, uh, perfusions effect uh, we see on top, uh, which is involved the basal uh, anterior, basal anterior septum uh, primarily, and then uh, that's matched by um, increased FDG uptake, but the FDG uptake is a little uh, focal and diffuse, uh, somewhere especially at the base, uh, and, and kind of extend a little bit beyond that uh, areas of, uh, of of perfusion defect, especially down to the you know uh, mid and, and and kind of distal, or at least mid uh, anterior wall, uh, which is I mean suggestive of uh, you know cardiosarcoidosis. Yeah, so this is a perfect mismatch that we would see. You could see it here that this uh, area here, for example, row thirty six on the top row here, um, is has an anterior and interoceptal perfusion defect that matches completely the anterior and interoceptal FDG uptake um, uh, 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 there. Um, you could see it also here in the basal proximal, in the basal anterior wall here, matching uh, uh, this uh, FDG uptake. So this is what we would call classically uh, a, a perfusion metabolism uh, mismatch. And in the corner, in the context of patients without known coronary disease, uh, and not following a coronary distribution, this would be suggestive of active uh, myocardial inflammation and in the context should be uh, uh, diagnostic of cardiac uh, sarcoidosis. So that's why we would say that this is not hibernating myocardium. It's the context and the prior CTA and so on, and also the diet. We did not do any insulin manipulation um, to promote um, uh, to promote glucose metabolism and free fatty acid metabolism to, sh to say uh, uh, hibernation. So yes, indeed, someone mentioned there, the protocol is different for hibernation and inflammation. And, and, and here it would follow the sarcoid uh, 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 finding. The other uh, clinical finding that we have um, was that, uh, remind me, Aldo, this patient was also at the same time had a diagnosis of extra cardiac Sarcoidosis. Yeah. yeah. So he um, he was uh, you know in the interim we kind of got to kind of know that uh, you know was uh, his, he was treated um, no history of neurosar neurosarcoidosis, uh, but that was never kind of referred to us, uh, and we just kind of in the investigations to actually see how to explain this kind of uh, typical defect we we found it, um, which kind of at least uh, add to the suspicion in you know to the diagnosis here for cardiac involvement. Good. And so this is when we do a PET FDG scan for cardiac sarcoidosis, we do obtain whole body imaging as well. And we could see it here. This is, uh, you can see that there is FDG uptake in the anterior portion of the myocardium, but also in the mediastinum. You could see it here. And we do quantification um, of the amount of myocardium in which the FDG uptake is above a threshold of 2.7 uh, in terms of SUV. And I think here we had something around 38 uh, uh, mLs of myocardium uh, with that volume. Yep. And um, someone else was asking about MRI. So Aldo is gonna uh, describe for us the MRI here. Yeah, so I guess that just to answer the question, I think now more and more and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, different groups in the field feel like the MRI and the PET might be complementary. Uh, so, uh, you know, you know that, that's kind of a growing kind of uh, emerging kind of, uh, you know, protocols that we, we send for both. Um, so here, um, what we see here is just to show you play it again. These are uh, Cine uh, SFP, just to show that uh, there's like an, you know, kind of akinetic, uh, uh, perhaps even dyskinetic, uh, um, you know, basal septum uh, uh, that we can see both in all the kind of the, the projections, including in the short axis um, uh, in there. Um, if you keep, uh, go to the next one. I mean, the, 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 the EF was uh, relatively preserved. If you go back, here we have a T2. T2 is a sequence that uh, you know um, is, is uh, looks for uh, you know, edema. Uh, so if you have water or uh, or fat, you tend to have a, a high signal in T2. Um, here we see that 
uh, and compared to the rest of myocardium, that kind of basal septum, basal anterior is a little hyper intense, uh, suggesting there's uh, some degree of, uh, of, of inflammation in that area. And that exactly correlates to the next panel on the right, which is the uh, LGE sequences, in which we see that there's, uh, in compared to the rest of the myocardium, that there's LG, uh, LGE uh, uh, in that area, which is involving the, the whole thickness of that segment. And more importantly, uh, that segment is not thin out, it's actually, if anything, expanded. Uh, uh, which is something that we see commonly in sarcoid. So I guess it's a very nice case that started as a, as a suspected, uh, you know, uh, coronary artery disease and, and dyspnea as an anginal equivalent and ended up as, uh, you know, being a cardiac involvement in this patient. So uh, I guess it's important to always not only report what you see, but also think out of the box if something doesn't make sense in terms of the distribution and, and things uh, and thing in other differentials, like in this case. Excellent. Any, that, that was a great description, uh, Aldo, and a multimodality, multi-step process to con get a uh, final diagnosis for this patient. So just to summarize, this patient with several coronary risk factors presented with dyspnea on exertion and, and eventually underwent a myocardial perfusion scan showing an abnormal and unusual finding of only basal fixed defect in the interior wall and with that, um, uh, given her risk factors and that finding, she underwent a CT angiogram that did not show any coronary artery disease. And, and with uh, trying to expand the differential diagnosis there um, and the new findings of extra cardiac sar neurosarcoidosis, she underwent a PET FDG that confirmed cardiac involvement of her sarcoidosis and the MRI confer further confirmed that in terms of uh, and the scarring and seen on the uh, LGE uh, sequences. So I think that was a nice uh, case showing how we went from a differential diagnosis and showing multimodality um, uh, uh, comprehensive evaluation. Um, as Aldo mentioned, uh, most practitioners now uh, appreciate the uh, complementarity of using PET FDG scan and MRIs, uh, especially in, uh, in patients who don't have contraindications to MRIs such as prior um, uh, intracardiac devices, for example. Um, any questions uh, here? Based on this case or any of the prior uh, cases, I think, uh, um, the audience did a great job at participating. We had a lot of interesting comments and questions in the uh, chat box. Someone was asking, uh, when will this be available uh, online? Uh, I think over the next few days, we will have uh, uh, the, 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 the presentation available. I believe the first session is already available. So this would be available within a day or two uh, as well. All right, um, Hisham, thank you very much for an excellent session. Um, and thank you, Aldo, uh, and all of you for joining. Um, these should be available for viewing, I'm told, within, I don't know, two to three days, uh, probably on the ASNIC website. So keep up the good work. We hope to see you tomorrow for another great session. Thank you all.